an inordinate desire to acquire more than one needs. An uncontrolled longing for the acquisition or use of material gain. Be it money, land, possessions, social value such as status or power. It's an ugly thing. Anybody been here the last couple weeks, seen the seven deadly sins? We're wrapping up today. That's right. We are going to be talking about greed and lust. Justin left those fun ones for me, but we're going to have a good time this morning. My name is Evan. I'm the online pastor. Thanks for watching. If you're watching, wherever you are, maybe you're watching this on demand later. We appreciate you choosing to make Simple Church a part of your week. Thanks to everybody in the room. Hope everybody had a great Halloween, extra hour of sleep today. And we are going to talk about greed. And Halloween is a perfect way for my family because we had to have some conversations last week with these cute little kids right here. Nora and Eliza, my two girls, are six and three, and any parent in the room knows you don't have to teach greed. Anybody get an amen on that, right? If you've been a parent, I think you, somebody in the room knows, but they are adorable, we love them, they're real sweet most of the time. This is the show called Bluey. If you're not watching Bluey, you're missing out. Best kids show on TV, hands down. We were the Bluey family, the Blue Healers. It's a little Australian dog. But the best part of Halloween, after you go trick-or-treating, is always what? Candy, sorting the candy. So this is where the tension comes in. We're talking about appetites today. It really covers all the seven deadly sins, but it's specifically greed and lust. Our appetites, we think about gluttony, we think about food, but it's really this desire to get the things that we think will make us happy. And as a kid, go in and count in your candy basket. Look at that joy on that face. It's exciting, it's awesome, but we had to put them in different rooms and make sure the piles were different so they don't start fighting over whose candy's who, right? Any parent knows this, so Eliza's in the kitchen, she has her stash, Nora had her stash, and immediately what do they start doing? Well, I'll trade you. Oh, you like that? I like this. Ooh, give me that, give me that. I want two of those. Well, you give me three of those for one, Eliza. Little big sister trying to take advantage of little sister. The math doesn't quite work out, but they all start fighting. So what do we do? We put it all in a big communal bucket and talk about sharing and have a life lesson for kids, and they still are mad about it. But we all figure it out. They'll be okay. Greed is something inherent in all of us. Kids bring that very, very obvious. If you think, well, I'm not a greedy person in here, we're going to challenge you by the end of the day, I promise. But today, as we talk about appetites, as we talk about these things that drive us, they're actually not bad things. We talk about the seven deadly sins in the spooky intro, right? Greed, we believe, is one of the seven deadly sins. But the appetite, the desire, is actually something that God gives us. There are lots of appetites. We think about food, but here's a list of some that I came up with. See if any of these sound like you. A list of appetite for success. You're driven. You want to have a successful business. You want to be successful and seen being successful. Going through an achievement kind of goes hand in hand. You want to be known for accomplishing something. Get the award. Hit the sales goal. You want to have the appetite of love. You want to be loved. You want to receive love. Not just romantic love, but friend and families loving you. We all have a desire and appetite to feel loved. Friendship respect, fame, and then stuff, more stuff and new stuff. Christmas around the corner, right? Anybody have some stuff they would like? I'm looking and shopping for new iPhones. I'm excited about getting a new iPhone, but it's not a bad thing to want stuff. But as we look at today, it's when that starts to get distorted and our priorities get out of balance that we start to get in trouble. And winning. I have some friends that refuse to play board games with us anymore. Anybody know people like that, right? I'm in recovery. I'm working on it. Very competitive, (laughs) trying to be better. Trying to see it, Nora, the six-year-old, got the drive for me because we play board games and there's been some tears shed, sometimes her, sometimes me, but we're trying to figure it out and be that competitive drive, that balance of wanting to win. It's not a bad thing, but all of these are appetites, desires, the way that we are wired as human beings, and they're not inherently bad, but we all know times and examples where they get out of control, where they cause you to go and to make choices, to sin, to do things that aren't the best plan for your life. Mallory and I watched a movie this weekend called The Eyes of Tammy Faye. Anybody remember Tammy Faye Baker, Jim Baker? There you go, televangelists. They were probably the most popular Christian celebrities, the most well-known in the 80s. They had this TV ministry. There were millions of people watching. So uh, Jessica Chastain, the actress, actually grew up watching her, is a believer, and talks about it in a couple interviews that I saw. And she really felt that Tammy Faye was kind of mistreated and wrote this movie and was the part of it 
to go and try to help. And if you've not seen them, Andrew Garfield, Spider-Man, right? And there, as Tammy Faye and Jim Baker, is shocking how much they look like her. But it's a very interesting movie of watching this progression of how they went from poor, backwoods, pastor, singer, to going in this greed where ultimately he spent time in jail for stealing money from the congregation, had some sins and affairs and all kinds of stuff that just their life became a mess. And this is all too common, right? So let's just pull some examples. I tried to go multi-generational here. Some people in the room remember this guy, America's dad. Sheesh. Mallory and I actually saw him do stand-up here in Shreveport right before all the stuff with the scandals broke, one of his last shows, because we grew up watching Bill Cosby. What's not to like, right? And then you find out he had an appetite, a desire that started to go take him down the road of making these awful choices that hurt people and ruined his career, his reputation. How about this guy? Come on, Jeffrey, you can do it. Jeffrey Bezos. How many of you guys know that Jeffrey Bezos, one of the richest men in the world, if not the richest, had an affair? And then the woman he was having an affair with, her brother sold the text messages about the affair to a tabloid and ended up embarrassing him, which led to his divorce, where she got billions of dollars, his ex-wife. More money normally means more problems, right? Next one, Tanya Harding. I think athletes, there's a movie. We like these stories. We want to know the dirt. We want to know the gossip. She hired a hitman to hurt her competition. And Margot Robbie played her in a movie about her life as we try to understand what got these people to this point where they would do something so crazy, so out of character. And if somebody was doing this about your life, what would they say? Another one, me and my dad, every Sunday we played golf growing up. Must watch TV, Tiger Woods. Appetite, knocked him out. Another one, baseball fan. When you look like this, and all of a sudden you look like that a couple years later, there's something probably going on there, Barry. All-time home run leader, not in the Hall of Fame. His legacy tarnished for an appetite to achieve to be successful. Another documentary I watched is a 30 for 30 called Broke, where they interviewed professional athletes from different sports. We think about athletes and they're put on such a pedestal. They're so revered and seen as heroes and look up to for kids. But so many of them get this fame and this wealth that most of us will never experience and end up broke. The quote that stuck out from me from the show, I remember, by the time they've been retired for two years, 78% of former NFL players are bankrupt or under financial stress. And if you watch the documentary, it's heartbreaking of family members that took advantage of them crooked people that were stealing their money, managing their money that was stealing it from them. All of these awful situations where it's not necessarily always their fault, but they also talk about going and spending money in clubs, buying cars for everybody, their friends, and they end up realizing the math doesn't work out. NBA players, same thing. 60% of former NBA players end up broke. So many students, I worked as a youth pastor for 10 years, so many teenagers want to be professional athletes. They pour their life into sports, and they think that's what's going to be enough. That's what's going to fix it. If they could just make the majors. They could just be a professional athlete. Let's go on to politicians, right? Yay. Everybody likes talking about politicians. Anybody remember this guy? There's a show right now called Impeachment American Crime Story where they're going through the dirt of Bill Clinton. That's Clive Owens. Anybody look up Clive Owens if you don't know who that is? It is unbelievable how much they made him look like Bill Clinton. But this appetite, even as the president of the United States, the most powerful person on earth, he couldn't get enough and he went and made a mistake that tarnished his career, his reputation, almost got him impeached. All these crazy stories, but side note on that, Newt Gingrich, the guy that was trying to go and get him kicked out of office, also having an affair at the same time. I don't feel like that gets talked about enough too. It's not like it's everybody's just all squeaky clean in this. Jim Carrey had a quote I thought said it best. I wish, or I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. Some of you in this room are like, well, shit. That might be true of all them, but if it was me, I could handle the money. I mean, I know that like I have 12 people on Instagram that follow me and I'm not that big of a deal, but if I was all of a sudden in the spotlight and all these people looked at me, I could do it. I think I got this. If I got the promotion, then I would be happy. 30 years ago, Bono sang about this. At the height of his success in this band, U2, he still hadn't found what he's looking for. So if those things don't satisfy, if that's not the answer, what is? And I truly believe that Jesus had the answer. That's why we have hope. That's why we can turn and trust a God that loves us, that wants us to live a life the best way. Not to be a buzzkill, not to have rules, not to make it where you can't have fun, but because you can live a life that avoids the consequences of the sin and the bad choices that go along with out-of-control appetites. Because the good news and the bad news is this. 
Your appetites are never going to go away. There's not three points I could tell you. There's not a message you could listen to. There's not a hundred messages you could listen to that are going to help you to make your appetites go away. We're made this way. We're wired this way. We all know people that go and act one way even though they know the right thing to do. God created appetites, but sin distorted them. They get twisted. They get out of control. They're not bad. It's not inherently bad to want to be successful, to want to have new stuff, but it's a heart issue because the lie is this. There's someone or something that will finally fully satisfy your appetite. I get to officiate some weddings every year and talk with people. We do premarital counseling at Simple Church if you choose to get married here. I think it's so valuable just to be able to talk and help as you get ready for your wedding, as you get ready for your marriage, really, beyond the wedding. And one of the things I tell them every time is that person you're marrying will not complete you. They can't. If anybody's been married for a little while, you know that person (laughs) is not God. Amen? My wife would say the exact same thing about me. We're all inherently selfish. We all are going to fall short. We're not going to be able to give the other person what they truly want. There's a lot of great, beautiful things about marriage, but nobody is ever going to be the person that completes you, that satisfies the appetite you have for love, for friendship, for companionship. And as I thought about all this, the thing that summed it up perfectly for me in my mind is the show Hoarders. Anybody ever seen Hoarders? Your eyes start twitching just thinking about it, right? This show is awful. (laughs) It stresses me out. But it really is an incredible thing that these doctors and psychologists are helping these people that obviously are sick, that obviously have an appetite that's way out of control. And just in case you've never seen it, just to put you in the mindset, this is one example of somebody that has gotten an appetite for stuff that's gotten out of control. Watch. Hey, you must be Randy. Yes. I'm Dr. Becky. Good to meet you, Dr. Becky. Nice to meet you. Well, this is your house, huh? Yes, this is my... Got quite a few things in here. Messy bowl in here. <laughs> Where do you eat? Um, mostly I go out for fast okay. food. Is this where you spend most of your time? Um, yeah, if I'm at home, yeah, that's probably where I spend most of my time. Mm-hmm. When I first walked into Randy's apartment, the thing that really stuck out was the fact that he was living in like a three by three space. There was not a place to sit. There's not a place to do anything, really. It, it was really, really sad. So, Randy, it looks like it's kind of tight. Is it okay if I just take a, a quick little tour around the corner? Sure. Is that all right? Sure. Okay. Oh. Randy, I had no idea there was a whole other room back here. Yeah. Yeah. How? Maybe somebody in your family you think is a hoarder, that's a hoarder, right? But they're on their way. (laughs) They started that path. We started pulling Christmas stuff out of the attic yesterday, and I'm like, we have so much junk. It's so much stuff we accumulate. I looked it up. There's 23 million garage storage units in America, just America, more than every other retail store combined. And what is right around the corner? Christmas. What are they trying to sell you? New stuff. Because your old stuff isn't good and you need the newest one. You need to have the best one. You got to wear the right stuff. You got to have the right shoes. You got to make more. You got to get more. So you'll feel that appetite to be accepted, to be perceived as successful, to know that you have the right things, the right stuff. And we keep buying and consuming and buying and consuming. The average American spends six hours a week shopping. That's average. Some of you are like, my wife makes up the average. Like, yeah, it happens. Some guys in here, I know some guys shoppers, but all of us can be guilty of wanting to do stuff. I want a new iPhone. (laughs) I want, I'm looking, I'm trying to figure out what the best deal is. But this is the heartbreaking one to me. 90% of divorces cite finances or financial stress as a reason for their divorce. Marriages are ended. Families are ripped apart because they could not contain the appetite, the urge to buy more stuff and they spend more than they make and it causes division and stress, and it's a bad, vicious cycle. The good news is Jesus understood this. Jesus helped to make us. God wired us this way. He knows how appetites should work, and he tried to tell us over and over and over again how we should handle money. He talked about money almost more than anything else with the time that he had on earth because it's a heart issue. It's really not about money. But how we handle money, how we deal with greed, 
affects so many parts of our lives. So I'm going to go and throw you just a couple examples of times Jesus talked about money. Mark 4.19, the seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life. The lure of wealth and the desire for other things, so no fruit is produced. Jesus telling a story about his word being so the seed that's trying to get people's heart to change, and one of the things that blocks it out is trying to be wealthy, trying to get more stuff. Another time, Luke, someone called from the crowd, teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Then he told him a story. The rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know, I'll get a storage unit. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years. Good job. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God came to him and said, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything that you work for? Another time. Jesus went on to say, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Another time in Luke, he goes on, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Watching the Eyes of Tammy Faye, this movie that came out, these televangelists, prosperity gospel preachers, one of the things Jim Baker says over and over and over again is God doesn't want you to be poor. God wants you to have wealth. God wants you to be successful. And that's true. God is not against having money and being successful and having wealth. He's against when the appetite becomes what your heart is so driven by, what you're so focused on drives out everything else. But don't worry, he talked about lust too. We're tying these two together. These all really overcap all the seven deadly sins. But when it comes to lust, this one's pretty harsh. <laughs> Matthew 5, 27, Jesus is speaking to him. You have heard it said, do not commit adultery. Check. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman to lust after her is already committed with adultery in their heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one part of your body then your whole body go and be depart to hell. Yikes. That's pretty hardcore, Jesus. We talk about the Bible's not really clear. I don't really know what it means. How do I interpret? That's about as frank as it gets. Because if you ask somebody, maybe it was your parents, maybe it was one of your best friends that have gone through an affair, that have lost their family, that have ended up ruined, they might say they would trade an eye or a hand for the situation they're in now. Obviously, it's hyperbole, it's extreme, but God knows these things lead us to a place that we don't wanna go. There's an enemy that is trying to seek and kill and destroy and ruin your life. And God wants to prevent that for you. So why did Jesus talk about this so much? Because he knows that Satan distorts our appetites. These good, inherently things that make us human, these desires are not bad, but there's an enemy, there's sin has entered the world that keeps us from doing the things we should do. Because here's the thing about appetites. If you want to take some notes, if you want to write something down, help you later, they're also on the Simple Church app. I put those in every week. You can go and download them, email them to yourself or a friend. Sometimes I see people picking pictures of the screen, and if that works for you, that's fine. They're a little dark and blurry, but all of that content is available for download each week. Go check it out and download it there. But appetites always whisper now and never later. Appetites never say, you know what? Let's think about that purchase for a couple days and come back and be responsible. Appetites say, you know, that new girl is pretty cute at the office. I'm going to go and just try to talk to her and see what happens. Shoot my shot. Always now, never later. Appetites want you to trade the ultimate for the immediate. We think about the short term so many times and not the long term. We miss out on God's best for us. Ultimately, your appetites will determine if you fulfill God's will for your life. None of us are beyond help. You've never too far gone but there's consequences when you make the choices that you make. Working as a student pastor for years, that is one reason I was so passionate about helping middle school students. 
I had the choice and I chose to work with middle school over high school students. A lot of people thought I was crazy. But middle school is such a critical age and choice in these students' lives where they're determining a lot of their future with the friends they hang out with, what they decide to do, if they're gonna follow what God says or go the world's way. And some of you in this room, you can look back and trace these choices in your life all the way back to middle school, early high school. And you're still going through and feeling some of the consequences now. Because when one of your appetites gets out of control, it's actually literally changing your brain. I love when the Bible matches up with psychology, with science, because I truly believe that God created everything. God knows us. And so the things he said in the Bible thousands of years ago, they didn't have MRIs, but he knows the human condition. He knows who we are. And as we discover these things, it turns out the Bible's almost always right, if not always they knew these things about us before. So this is the th idea of impact bias. We're gonna get a little clinical, a little psychological here for a minute. Impact bias is when we take a simple appetite and magnify it out of proportion. These things that we think are so important, so driven, what's the most important thing in our life becomes a bias, a blind spot. We can't see the full picture. If you think about the guy who was a hoarder, he probably didn't think, you know what? When I buy this thing and I'm just gonna set it in this room five years from now, I'm gonna end up on a TV show about being a hoarder, right? He didn't wanna be that. He didn't plan on being that, but somehow he looks back at his life and sees, man, how did I get here? How did this happen? He had a bias. He had this idea that he couldn't get out of his head, that he needed more stuff. He couldn't get rid of any stuff, and it changed his life. So the two parts of impact bias, break it down even further, is focalism. When people think about the impact of future events, they tend to forget about all the other things that are ongoing into their lives. Do you know anybody like this? Somebody that's so driven at work, so focused about their career, starting that business, making that sales number, hitting these goals, that everything else just kind of gets pushed to the background and they forget groceries, they don't remember to go do this, they blow off meeting with friends. Maybe it's your impact bias for that person, right? Anybody have ever a friend that starts dating somebody and all of a sudden they won't return calls or texts, they go missing, you haven't seen them. They only can be one thing at a time because they think that is what's gonna make them happy. That's what I need. And all the other stuff gets pushed to the background. In reality, the one event we're imagining will likely be overshadowed by all sorts of other events that happen at the same time. You can go and be so focused on one thing, you miss everything else happening in your life. So we get focused, this focalism, we get so laser focused on one thing and the other part of impact bias that happens at the same time is sense making because people have a natural tendency to rationalize what happens to them. We all do this. When something bad happens, we initially feel unhappy but immediately start searching for the underlying reason. Why did this happen? Why did something bad happen? Once we've decided of the cause or causes, we, feel, we start to feel better. So we justify, right? The reason this relationship didn't work out was them. Oh, how was I so blind? How did I not see this before when we were dating? Why didn't any of my friends tell me? They all tried to tell you, but you didn't listen. And you look back and you're like, well, he was just the wrong guy. She was just the wrong girl. I'm gonna find somebody else. And you get back and start swiping again, hoping this time it's what you need. It'll complete you. It's what you're looking for. We think these appetites are our friend that are helping us that get so driven but it's really causing us to miss out on the best things of life. The Bible says it this way, Jeremiah 17, nine, the heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? It's very trendy and working with teenagers for years that kind of the undercurrent of culture is just listen to your heart, be true to yourself. You do you, figure it out. Nobody can judge me, I'm just gonna do me. And we think that as a 12 year old, 14 year old, 16 year old, 18 year old, we know everything that's gonna be the best thing for our life. Really? You think a 12 year old knows and has the foresight to be able to plan out everything that's gonna happen and they know best? I don't, <laughs> I spend a lot of time with 12 year olds. It's, it's not always firing in all the right cylinders, bless them. It's not bad, they think they have this plan but the heart deceives. We cannot trust our heart, self-help doesn't work. The self-help industry sells millions of dollars because it's a lot easier, it's a lot less scary to believe, well, you know what, I can break this addiction by myself. I don't even really wanna call it addiction, it's more of a habit because that's like, that sounds less scary. 
But I, this time, I know I'm going to go, I'm going to wait till January. We're going to put it off two months. And then in January, it's going to be my New Year's resolution, and I'll get it this time on my own. I'm going to listen to that audio book, and I'm going to be self-helped, and I'll be great. Everything will be fixed in January. And then we'll talk again in March. And then we'll talk again in June. And you'll look back, and it's been two, three, four, five years. And you're still going and wrestling with the same problem. So we'll talk about a story as we talk about these appetites in the Old Testament of two guys that I think sums it up really well, Jacob and Esau. They're brothers. This is in the book of Genesis. And Jacob goes and pulls a fast one on his brother who gives in to his appetite. Genesis 25 says, The boys grew up. Esau became an expert hunter and outdoorsman, and Jacob was a quiet man preferring life indoors among the tents. Always identified more with Jacob in this story. Maybe you're an Esau. That's cool. I've always felt a little bit more like Jacob. But these two brothers, very different, very different personalities. Isaac, their dad, loved Esau because he loved the game, the food that Esau brought back as a hunter. But Rebecca, the mom, loved Jacob. One day, Jacob was cooking stew. Esau came in from the field starved. His appetite was out of control. He was so hungry. Esau said to Jacob, give me some of that red stew. I'm starved. And what did Jacob say? Make me a trade, my stew for your rights as the firstborn, or a birthright. Now, this is something that really doesn't translate. This is something in our culture today we don't really have. It's not really something that we believe in. I'm the firstborn. Anybody in here the firstborn? A couple of you raising hands. All right, thanks for being here. We are excited because we would have got the hookup back then. As firstborn, it was very unfair. If you look at this image I'd made to try to explain it, the biblical birthright, this idea in those times and their culture, was the first thing you got a double inheritance, right? Anybody get an amen on that? Some of you are like, my parents don't have any money to leave me. That's fine. <laughs> but back then, especially, this family was very wealthy. Esau was set up to become very rich and get the double inheritance, double the next closest person in this family. He also, and this is the best part, got to be the judge in family issues. So I just want you to imagine, Thanksgiving's coming up in a few weeks. You show up to family Thanksgiving, and everybody comes and gathers around you, and you say, all right, I'm going to start hearing complaints, and you get to be the one who rules in every family dispute, and your word is final. As the firstborn, with the birthright, you got to decide when your dad died who was right, who was wrong, who has to pay reparations, who has to give money back, who has to pay a fine, land, any of that. Anybody would be pumped for November at Thanksgiving if that happened, right? That would make family gatherings a lot simpler. It's a big deal. And then the third thing is something that we really can't even understand. It was a different time. It's pre-Jesus. Before we had the chance to have that relationship with Christ, in the Old Testament, you actually were, had God's blessing on your life. This mysterious spiritual thing that you were blessed more than other people. It doesn't sound fair. It's even hard to think about it. But that's the way it worked in this time before Jesus Thank God, Jesus means we all have the same relationship now. We're all on equal playing field, right? Some of you babies of the family are like, yes. All right, moving on. Esau. Maybe. There we go. I'm starving. What, goes, what good is a birthright if I'm dead? He ate and drank, got up and left, and that's how Esau shrugged off his rights as the firstborn. One bowl of stew. All the things that God wanted for his life are gone. And you're like, man, what an idiot, <laughs> right? How do you look at Esau and not say, I cannot believe he did that, it's so stupid. Oh, thank, man, I'm glad I'm not Esau. But we do this all the time. From the outside looking in at your life, you can see, but it's really hard when you're in the moment that you're trading the best things, you're trading your birthright, the things that God wants for your life for something temporary that's gonna be gone like that, a bowl of stew. Some of you, it's not even you, but it's you're dealing with the repercussions of a family member, a parent, a mom that chose pills over being your mom. A dad that chose the bottle of her showing up. The parent that found somebody else that's going to complete them. You know, this wife, this husband, they don't really get me anymore. I'm going to leave them, but the next one, that's what I need. Two or three or four marriages later, you're still dealing with the consequences of that. Because that appetite will never be fully satisfied. And even beyond that, in this story specifically, hundreds of years later, when Matthew would write the genealogy of Jesus, we read it around Christmas time sometimes. You go back and see 
all the people that led to Jesus, Esau's name would be left out. Esau gave away this chance to be in that family lineage, to be the one that was honored in that place to be a part of Jesus' family. We give away our birthright for a bowl of stew. So what do you do? We all get it. We know the world's messed up place. We know there's sin. We know there's problems. Great. Now what do you do? I really don't think you can do it on your own. And that's the scary part. That's the hard part. That's where most people can't get over the idea that they would be vulnerable, they would talk to somebody, they would share what they're going through. If I'm not perceived as successful, if I'm not perceived as strong, if I don't have it all together, I won't reach the success, the fame, the money, the, all the things that I really want in life. I'm just gonna figure it out myself. And the reframing, if you're gonna write down one thing, if you want one thing out of this message, this question is something we call the best question ever. I've taught it for students for years, it is such a great tool because it changes all the ways you look at every decision that you make. You reframe this question, not what is the right thing, what's the illegal thing, what can I get away with, what's the closest I can get to sin without getting by. In light of my future hopes and plans, and in, based in my past circumstances, what is the wise thing for me to do? Because most of the time, we'll be honest, you know the wise thing. We just justify. We focus. You know what? It's probably not wise that I talk to her at the office and it's kind of flirty now. And if my wife knew, she probably wouldn't be happy. But it's just innocent. It's just, we're just talking. I mean, you know, I reconnected with him on Facebook and we're sending messages. And my husband would probably be mad if I saw these, but it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Nobody will really know. It makes me feel good. And we lose the best things for a temporary gain, for a bowl of stew? What is the wise thing to do? So the question I wanna leave you as we talk about this, as we wrap up, is who do you wanna be five years from now? Let's fast forward to our future selves, 2026. We're gonna say COVID's gone, amen, right? Everything's back to normal. Life is good again. Who do you wanna be? If you had to go and get a snapshot of your future self five years from now, if you're married, do you wanna stay married? I hope so. If you're a parent, do you want to have a great relationship with your kids? I hope so. I think all of us would say these things, but then it goes back to today, right now, what am I choosing over the best things? What's the bowl of stew in your life? What is the thing that you're chasing right now? Because your appetite only wants more. It's always going to want more. Nothing is ever going to be enough. You get the one thing, you finally get that pair of shoes, and you need more. You need to build a bigger collection. You finally get the promotion, and then you need more. You need to be the next level. You need to start your own business so you can be your own boss. What is your bowl of stew that you're chasing? Your appetite always says more and always only chooses one time right now. I need it now. We got to do this now. I don't want to stop and think about it. I don't want to talk to anybody about it. I'm just going to go do it. I'm going to trust my heart. But so many times we believe right we know the right things. We play the game. We say the church answers. We believe right, and we choose to do wrong. We all know people like this. We do this. It's a lot easier to point it out than other people. I do this. I know when my kids are being annoying. I know that I should have peace, patience, calm, gentleness, perseverance. But I don't want to. <laughs> I want to be selfish. I want to snap. I think if I yell at them, we'll get the result that I want. Whatever that is for you, who do you want to be five years from now? I don't want to be a dad that my kids remember being angry and yelling at them and being impatient. I'm trying to work on that. None of us are perfect. This is never going to go away. But specifically when it comes to lust, I went and spoke with a counselor today just because it's kind of weird. It's kind of awkward. Nobody really likes talking about this. But there is an epidemic of sexual sin, of addiction, working with teenagers for the last 10 years over and over and over again. And if you're somebody that that specifically is the thing that's hung you up right now that you're dealing with, I don't think self-help's ever gonna work. You need somebody else to talk to. And really, most of us in almost every area need somebody else. So I spoke with a professional counselor, a guy named Ross Givens at Clint Davis Counseling. We work with Clint Davis. We believe in counseling. Most of our staff goes to counseling. I go to counseling. If your car needs an oil change, 
you go get the oil changed somewhere. Maybe some of you do it yourself. That maybe is a bad example, but you get what I'm saying. We all need somebody outside of ourselves to help speak into our life, and we believe that Christian counselors, godly people, are able to do that in a way that nobody else can. And some of you would benefit a lot. It could maybe change this direction of your life. And Ross tells you some ways to do that. Check out the video. Hi, my name is Ross Githens. Uh, I'm a counselor here at Clint Davis Counseling Center. And uh, today I was going to help uh, provide some resources uh, following the message on uh, lust and greed. Uh, you know, obviously we believe lust can, can really affect a lot of us. And I believe individual counseling. Uh, and we also have uh, groups that can help uh, people who are struggling with either pornography or love addiction. Uh, some of the statistics that I, I think that we study in sex addiction is that uh, in Shreveport and surrounding cities, we can estimate around 600, 650,000 people. We would estimate that there's around 20,000 sex addicts in our area. The sign that you need help is gonna be that something is not working, uh, whether that's uh, failing in school, a marriage is suffering, it becomes a repetitive issue. Drinking, for example, I, I think we look for are you having a beer or are you drinking 15 beers, 20 beers, something that's so high, so incredible in volume that it's not even normal. So obviously there's not a goal here to, to morally judge anyone, but if someone's looking at porn once a year, that becomes an accident, that becomes a, a slip. When someone is showing frequency or repetitiveness, uh, then we say, okay, this is becoming a, a disorder, uh, something that's extreme and is gonna need more than just uh, a Band-Aid. In a couple situation, I would recommend that couple go to counseling together and talk about what are things that she sees because there's a chance she may be right, but there, there's a chance she may be wrong. So I don't wanna make every wife out there an expert, but I do wanna gather those resources, get in front of a professional and talk through uh, is he is his appetite normal? Is his appetite even sustainable? Uh, and what are what are the reasons that she has that she thinks he has a problem? The one thing about lust is that you've got to make sure that shame and judgment and conviction correction doesn't keep you from help. The the key to recovery is humility and the willingness to get support, the willingness to be courageous and do some extraordinary things, some terrifying things. Because I, I respect the men who are willing to attend these groups and willing to raise men, not addicted to porn, but they raise men and they teach them as they've learned themselves, this is how I battle my lust. This is how I protect my marriage. These are things that we have decided are inbounds and out of bounds. And I think that that, that is a, something I see repetitively in therapy is that men are so ashamed, women are so broken because the shame, the conviction, the condemnation, especially in the South, uh, there, the secrecy makes the temptation, makes the sin even worse. And I think confession leads to healing. And so if I'm gonna confess one to another, as the book of James says, I've got to be willing to be honest and, and get the help that I need to be the man, to be the woman that God has called us to be. I know, a little weird, a little awkward. Nobody likes talking about it, but I truly, truly believe that there are people in this room, there are people watching online that need help, that are trying to get this appetite under control to pull out of this spiral they've been in themselves. And we don't want to give you shame. We don't want to give guilt. We want to help you. Email me. We'll help you get set up with a counselor. We'll pay for three visits. You get referred to one here. If you're out of town, you're watching online, we'll help you find one in your area. Please reach out. We're here to help. We don't want you to ruin your life. We don't want you to throw your family away. We don't want you to end up making a consequence that affects you the rest of your life because you're too embarrassed or too afraid. Secrets make you sick. We want to help you. Wrap up on this. There's a guy you might have heard of pretty famous, pretty wealthy guy named John D. Rockefeller. About 100 years ago, he was one of the wealthiest people that have ever lived in the history of the world. John D. Rockefeller was worth billions, you see on there, ranked in one of the top four richest people ever. And this famous story goes around at his funeral. He's died, he's left all this money, and somebody goes up to his accountant and says, hey, I just gotta know, how much did he leave? And the accountant turns to him and says, all of it, it's all 
gonna be gone one day. All the stuff you're chasing, all the bowls of stew you filled your life up with are gonna be gone. And if there's a young person listening, I've been passionate about student mission for years because I want to help you from having to go through the consequences I've seen friends go through, seen family members go through. You don't want that. I don't want that. Your parents don't want that. Nobody wants to end up on a hoarder's TV show where a lady's crawling all over your stuff to help you pull out of this mess you've made. But it happens all the time. Because the sad truth is, where we are in America living today, most of us, I'd say 99.9% .9 of us would say, oh, I'm not rich. Good thing it's not my struggle. Whew, move on. I don't have any money, so I don't have to worry about greed. We fail the test of prosperity. It's almost worse than people in poverty. If you own a car, you're in the richest 98% of people in the world. If you have a home, that bumps you up to the 99th percentile. If you make more than $400 a year, you are considered rich on a global standard. You don't have what your friends have. You don't have what your neighbors have. We all can make more money. But we fail this test of prosperity so many times because God knows our heart chases after the appetite. What's at stake when it comes to doing this? What's the, what's the stakes? What does it matter if you get your appetites under control? Everything. Every part of your life is affected by this. And choosing to follow God, choosing to deny yourself, choosing to seek wise counsel, choosing to talk to somebody else, get in a life group. There's a men's integrity life group starting this week. There's life groups that you go. You don't have to show up and confess your deepest, darkest sins the first time you get there. But is somebody in your life following God, helping you? Find a way to check these appetites. We'll end with this. Jesus says it in Mark 8, 35. You've probably heard this. There's songs about this. Just a refresher. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. If you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, that's how you'll save it. What does it gain to get the whole world and lose your soul? Don't let an appetite determine your future. Be generous. Ask for help. Don't make it to where we come and find you in a crisis and have to dig you out of your hoarder house. Who do you want to be five years from now? Let's start working towards that. Let's pray. God, I'm so thankful for the people that are here that chose to be here this morning to get up, to fight the crowd, to park, to do all the things. God, maybe if they're watching at home that they chose to make us a part of their life to listen this morning. And I'm just so honored, God, that you allowed me to be a part of this. And I pray that you would speak to the people in this room and watching online, watching on demand later and help them to do the work to figure out that bowl of stew they're chasing right now. God, I don't know every story. I don't know every situation. But I know that I need you. I need the people in my life that care about me. I need a counselor to help me to know the wise thing to do, to help talk through things that I'm not sure, to fight my selfish nature. And I really believe, God, that all of us benefit from that. And there are some people listening, there are some people right here in this room that are so tangled up in the sin, in the mess that they've made that they don't know how to get out. God, I pray they would have the courage to reach out. Maybe it's not me, but if they wanna go on YouTube, watch some more of these videos to get help. Talk to a friend or a family member, maybe have that hard conversation for the first time in a while that things aren't right, not justified, not to be so focused and forget about the other things that are truly important. But ultimately, God, I pray that you would be the one that changes their life. God, you are the one that's still a miracle worker. You are the one that can take our mess and wash it white as snow. And if there's anybody that's here that doesn't have a relationship with you, God, I pray that they would seek you. They would ask you to come into their heart, God. They would reach out to us and they wanna know more about having a relationship with Jesus and we can help walk through that. That they would know, God, that you are the only thing that will ever satisfy. We love you, amen. Thanks for being here today. Next week, new series, Holiday Survival Guide. The holidays are coming. We want to help you and your family to survive it, right? Not just survive, but thrive. Thanks for being here today. Grab an Operation Christmas Child box on your way out. You can help be generous, do good, fill a box in Jesus' name, and give a gift. Thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. Peace.